When German discount retailer Lidl entered the United Kingdom, it encountered one of the most competitive markets on the planet. Four big British supermarkets stood in its way, and after 20 years of operating in the UK, Lidl had carved out a small, impressive, but still slightly disappointing 3% market share. And it asked the question, why can't we grow any more than this? And the answer came down to two things. First, the British shopper assumed after many years of training that if something was low price, it had to, by definition, also be low quality. Lidl's low prices, which it clearly signalled, were communicating to the British consumer, you also must be low quality too. And that was borne out in the consumer research, which showed that the British consumer perceived Lidl's fruit and vegetables and meat and poultry significantly lower quality than its British competition, even though in reality the quality was as good if not better. And so Lidl faced a real strategic problem. You can't use your advertising dollars to tell the customer they're wrong, even though you know your products are high quality. And yet Lidl knew that from their experience and qualitative research, when British shoppers often accidentally discovered Lidl's quality, they were first surprised and then delighted and finally became regular shoppers. Little asked itself a key question in 2013. How can we engineer more of those surprises so we can grow our market share? But there was a second problem, not perceptual, if anything, an even bigger challenge to overcome. Little was a small brand. And for 30 years, thanks to the work of uh, marketing professor John Philip Jones, we know that small brands have to work harder. In the Harvard Business Re Review about 30 years ago, Jones discovered an almost perfect correlation between a company's share of market, let's say 10%, and share of voice, the proportion of advertising that it contributes to the category, let's say again, 10%. He discovered that when you examine the relationship between those two, they enjoy an almost straight line relationship. If you have a 5% market share, you have approximately a 5% share of voice. And also, Jones observed something was going on over time with the dynamics on that equilibrium. If a brand underspent, so it had a much higher share of market and a lower share of voice, eventually, and perhaps inevitably, its market share would also fall to the levels of its share of voice. But in contrast, if a brand overspent and had a higher share of voice versus share of market, in many cases, indeed in most cases, its market share would eventually increase. That difference, that positive difference between share of voice and share of market is called excess share of voice. If I have a 20% share of voice, but only a 10% share of market, I have an excess share of voice of plus 10. We often abbreviate it to ESOV, and it's one of the most important and least understood concepts in the world of marketing effectiveness. And there was something else that Jones observed from his data. If you looked at small brands, let's say one in this case with a 5 or 6% market share, that brand had to overspend, it had to have a positive ESOV in order to maintain that level of market share, perhaps an 8 or 9% share of voice. In contrast, the big brands, let's say with 20 or 22% market share, could get away with a share of voice that was perhaps 15 or 16% and still maintain their position. How come the big brands got it easier than the small brands? Well, the answer is disappointing for all of those that you believe in agility and entrepreneurial thinking. The great analysis firm Data to Decisions regularly looks at what are the key drivers of advertising profitability. When you invest a dollar in advertising, what are the factors that ensure you get a better or worse return? Here's the top 10 from 10 up, as you see here, to three. And there's some usual suspects. But the two biggest ones, the two factors that guarantee the best marketing effectiveness at number two is creative execution, something we'll cover in the Tide case later in the series but also at the top with an astonishing 18 time multiplier is just simply whether a brand is already big and large and established and has a suitable share of shelf and share of mind so that every dollar it spends on advertising immediately kicks in a significant response. The big boys always win. So as Little sat down to develop its strategy in 2014, it was very clear what it had to do. First, the aspiration, obviously, to grow and accelerate its sales and market share. 
the target all British households. It wanted to increase general penetration. The position, surprise with fun, create more of that discovery of quality. And the strategy itself is divided into two very distinct objectives. The communication strategy to overcome that first perceptual barrier, dispel the myth that Lidl's low prices come at the expense of quality. That was done with a series of brilliant executions, starting with a terrific TV advertising campaign. Now then, so tell me how does our pan au chocolat really compare? Good. It tastes the same as the French one. <laughs> the blueberry muffins, they're whole blueberries. If I had a cafe, I'd come and buy yours. <laughs> Just here trying bread. Multi grain loaf for 70 75 Right, let's get some spending on. Everything you see here, including the chocolate cookies, are available every day in your local Lidl. Lidl's a good shop. It's wonderful. And it was matched with print ads that rather than trying to sell uh, products on a short-term activation basis, pushed again that message of surprise and quality through a series of cleverly written print ads. And then there was social media. Lidl picked up uh, tweets and other social media interactions that captured the surprise of customers and then replayed them through its own earned media and also in store blowing up uh, tweets and literally playing them back to thousands of customers in store. In this case, a gentleman surprised at the quality of Lidl's own wine. But remember, it wasn't just about overcoming perceptions. Lidl also had that problem of ESOV. And in order to handle that, they also had a major objective, which was commit to generating significant excess share of voice. Back in the days before this campaign began, Lidl enjoyed approximately a 3% market share and approximately 5% share of voice. That's a positive ESOV of 2%, but as we know, as a smaller brand, that's probably barely enough to maintain its existing position in the market. So, in 2014, it increased its share of voice to a whopping 9%. Take the 3% market share of the 9% share of voice, you get 6% ESOV. A year later, it increased it to a whopping 19%, giving it an ESOV of 16%. A year later, again, a 16% excess share of voice, a massive increase. Finally, in 2017, it took the foot off the pedal a little bit and came down to a 10% ESOV, still very significant. And you'll also note, as they're doing this, the market share of Little is beginning to move. The results were spectacular. First, that perceptual gap about quality of food in terms of food and vegetables and meat and poultry very quickly disappeared to the point where it became a point of parity rather than a point of weakness. And Lidl managed to double their market share in the period of five years, going from 3% share to 6% in the United Kingdom, thanks mostly to this incredibly clever campaign. In fact, Lidl's own econometric research suggests that during that four or five year period, the advertising generated a whopping £2.7 billion in incremental sales. And no surprise, in 2017, it won a gold effie for this wonderful work. The key lessons we take from Lidl. Yes, Lidl had outstanding insights, strategy and tactics, but understanding ESOV and how it played a role in their growth was the essential factor in the success of this particular campaign. Goliath usually wins against David, despite what you might have read. Bigger brands have bigger scale, they get better automatic efficiencies, and should any smaller brand try and increase their spend, very often they'll dig deeper into those big poppets, spend more in order to raise the bar a little bit higher and maintain their superiority. Scale advantages, better efficiencies, deeper pockets. Size really, really is important. Visit the EFI's website for a database of all their amazing case studies and come to Marketing Week for more videos in this series and information on the Mini MBA in marketing.